So yeah, I'm Dr. Claire Russ. I'm one of five clinical psychologists that have just joined the school very recently. So Emma Travers Hill is a clinical psychologist. She started a couple of years ago. I joined in January and we've had three new clinical psychologists join us just through August. Um, so the school have kind of started to develop and kind of um, beef up, I suppose, their clinical psychology um, teaching a little bit. And that's kind of a reflection of why now we've got more clinical psychologists and the teaching staff. So I'm involved uh, in teaching the masters that we have here in clinical associate psychology, which is one of the new psychological professions that the BPS have launched in England. Um, and we're currently halfway through teaching our first cohort and the next cohort will launch in September 2023. So when you guys join, we'll have that as a kind of regular rolling masters that you might be interested in when you finish your undergrad. So today's topic is what is mental illness? And I want to start by acknowledging that this might be a very difficult topic for some people, okay, and that it's likely that I'm probably talking to people with lived experience, either directly or indirectly through kind of loved ones and friends. And so I just want to say from the outset, please do make sure that you're taking care of yourself. If things feel a bit difficult, do feel free to kind of dip in and come dip, dip out and come back in again if you need to. Um, it, is, it is a tricky topic to talk about and to think about, especially the way that we're going to be doing today, which is in a very kind of academic kind of style. So please do take care of yourself as we as we talk through the slides. Um, and so some of you might also be wondering, well, why is this even the topic of the talk, right? What is the point of this? Because if I was to ask all of you here today for a definition or an explanation of mental illness, it's likely that you'd probably say similar things. Maybe you talk about it in terms of diagnostic labels. You might say things like, oh, it's like depression or anxiety or schizophrenia. Maybe some of you would talk about it in terms of distress or kind of an absence of happiness. But it's likely that all of you would probably say similar things um, and talk, talk along similar lines. So why is this the subject of this talk then? Why is this not a straightforward and simple answer? Well, Let's think for a minute about some of the people who may not be represented here and how they might answer that same question. So if you were to ask your grandparents what they thought mental illness was, a samurai warrior from the 16th century, a single mother of five living on benefits in Moss Side, Manchester, or a Pacific Islander living in Polynesia, you're likely to get very, very different answers. Depending on where you live, when you were alive, your beliefs, your cultures, you may have vastly different understandings about what mental illness is. And why is that? Well, uh, I don't know if you keep this picture's actually in the way, maybe that's there. Um, mental illness is a construct, okay? And a psychological construct are kind of labels and concepts that we develop to explain a phenomenon that we can see. So labels like depression and anxiety are labels that we've come up with, clinical psychologists, psychiatrists have come up with to try and make sense of patterns of behavior or of symptoms that we observe in people. These constructs are hypothetical. So they're not necessarily right or wrong. They change over time. So um, I think it was as recent as sort of 30 years ago, depression and anxiety were the same diagnosis, you were diagnosed with depression and anxiety, and then they separated them out into two separate diagnoses. And they're also culturally bound. So different countries, different places around the world will have a different way of kind of thinking about mental illness or mental health and distress. So with things like depression, we can't directly test it, we can't touch it, we can't see it. You can't sort of cut somebody's head open and have a look at their brain and there's a bump there and that bump is depression. So we have to infer or assume that it exists through the symptoms that we see, like low mood, fatigue, diminished interest and pleasure in activities. Um, and kind of as of today in 2020, we still aren't in agreement about what the underlying causes of mental illnesses are. So whether they're uh, caused by a biological thing, so a difference in the brain structure, difference in um, a chemical in your body called neurotransmitters, whether they're caused because of social contexts, so poverty, um, trauma, and whether that causes mental illness. There's no real kind of agreement, uh, either historically or now, about what causes a mental illness. So 
in thinking about that, there are kind of three different models that we use to try and understand distress. Oh, I'm just noticing there's a thing in the chat. Okay, I'll come to the questions at the end. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't a thing like, we can't see the slides. Um, so the first explanation of distress is kind of a psychogenic one. And that's the idea that the cause of distress arises outside of the mind, right? Um, and so that's a very CBT approach to, um, to kind of distress, right? In that you have kind of negative thoughts and kind of um, the way that you think leads you, leads you to have distress. There's a somatogenic idea about distress, which is distress is caused in the body. And that's where you'd find the kind of neurotransmitter theories, your kind of differences in brain structure theories. And then you have the sociogenic explanation, which is distress caused by your kind of social locations so things like poverty, events in the world like COVID and your relationships with others. So throughout our history, we've had varying kind of supports for these different models. And what I, what I think is really, really important, especially in mental health, um, is that we talk historically so that we understand how we've gotten to the system that we work in today. So to do that, we're going to go back to the ancient Greeks. Now, before we get started talking about these historical um, perspectives, just want to flag that we will I will be using language that they used at the time okay so words like madness and insanity and that can be very difficult language to hear so please do take care especially in these slides and if you need to mute me and come back in when these slides are finished that's absolutely fine so thinking about ancient Greeks there are kind of two threads of understanding on what we would call mental illness right um, the kind of cultural, traditional understandings that we see in Homeric myth and in Greek drama were very psychogenic and sociogenic in their, in their thinking. Heroes and heroines suffered madness as a result of tragic events and the clash of conflicting desires or as a punishment from the gods. But in mainstream Greek medicine, what we saw was a humoral model where um, mental, mental illness or kind of madness, it was what they called it at the time, was the result of an excess in bodily fluids, either in yellow bile for mania or um, black bile for melancholia. And so what they would do is drain people of those fluids in an attempt to make them feel better. The humoral model was used, um, there's evidence of it being used throughout the Roman times, but during the Roman Empire, Christianity really became... Um, quite popular and kind of became the mainstream framework, I guess, if you like, um, in terms of how we thought and saw the world. So it was in the Middle Ages where we saw this sort of change in narrative where what they called insanity was caused by Satan, was a sign of holiness or was God's vengeance due to moral failings. And there's documented cases and evidence of physicians recommending formal prayer for treatment for those that we would see as mentally unwell. This continued until we get to the Renaissance and the Age of Enlightenment. And this around the around this time is where scientific discovery really took a big boom. Right. And suddenly there were these groups of people who were challenging the church's authority and the church's narrative about the way the world worked. At this point, madness, as they called it, they viewed was due to failures in sense organs and nervous systems. So we're back now again on a somatogenic understanding of distress and of causes. And around this time, we had some really famous philosophers starting to talk about this stuff. Oh, sorry, actually, they continue to talk about this stuff. Um, and we kind of entered into this uh, age of reason. So the mind and the body being two separate entities, and that if we were capable of reason, we were also capable of unreason, which is what we would kind of talk about as mental ill health. And Descartes was a big kind of talker about that. Um, but also uh, John Locke. So in his essay concerning human understanding, he said, Mad men do not appear to me to have lost the faculty of reasoning, but having joined together some ideas very wrongly, they mistake them for truths, and they err as men do that argue right from wrong principles. For by the violence of their imaginations, having taken their fancies for realities, they make right deduction from them. So this is very, very psychogenic view of kind of madness or kind of what we would call mental illness right um where it was all kind of thinking errors and people just needed to be shown a different way to think and and that would really really help so while all these kinds of theoretical thinking and philosophical thinking was taking place there were also really concrete social changes that also influenced where we are today in our understanding of mental illness 
So um, Foucault, who's a, a quite famous French philosopher, well, in what he described as the Great Confinement, which began technically in 1377, but continued especially over the 1800s, um, we started to see asylums being built. Um, St. Mary of Bethlehem, which was later called Bedlam, you may have heard of it, um, began caring for what they termed the insane. And by the 1800s, over 50 private for-profit madhouses, as they called them, were in existence throughout the UK. Now, mad doctors, as they were called, who were in charge of these asylums, made lots of money from them, but their profession lacked legitimacy. So other physicians and other professional kind of... Um, kind of men as they were at the time, um, kind of questioned their competence and their motives and kind of didn't really respect them very much. Um, and your experience of these asylums varied heavily depending on whether you were rich or poor. So you'd have these massive asylum sites and on the site, if you were rich, you could have your own private house, you could hire your own staff, you could um, ride to the hounds, which is uh, hunting. But if you were poor, the experience of these asylums was very brutal. So you would be uh, uh, experiencing physical restraint, bloodletting, purges and vomits. And we can see from the kind of treatments that they were enacting in these asylums that we're back to a very somatogenic understanding of where mental illness and distress comes from, because they were using very physical treatments in an attempt to get people better. Um, and it was around this time as well. So William Tuke, actually just a, a wealthy merchant and a Quaker, he went to visit a Quaker friend who lived in one of these asylums and was absolutely horrified by what he saw there. And so he did the kind of olden day equivalent of crowdfunding uh, and he got the finances together to set up his own asylum, but he called it a retreat in 1796. And it's here that we start to hear kind of what smatterings of potential psychology interventions, right? So um, there was kind of, yeah, early psychologists in that the doctors at these retreats would mainly through sheer force of personality, try to subdue the sufferer and use other psychological tactics to rescue the insane from their affliction. OK, so we start to see kind of talking therapies almost, but not quite just in their very, very early forms. And a really good kind of case example of that was um, a doctor called Pinnell. Um, and there was a case study that he wrote about where he held a trial for one of his patients to acquit him uh, when they had the delusion that they uh, had been sentenced to execution. So kind of these very different ideas to try and sort of support people with, with, their, with their mental illness, um, moving away from these physical kind of treatments. So to try and make themselves more legitimate, to try and get more respect from their peers. Um, the people in charge of these kinds of asylums banded together and to become a profession. They call themselves alienists. Um, and in 1841, they banded together to form the Association of Medical Offices of Asylums and Hospitals for the Insane. They also launched their own scientific journal, uh, which uh, started off called the Asylum Journal, but it's subsequently called the British Journal of Psychology, which is still in publication today. And you'll probably come across it in your kind of undergrad studies. Um, and it was in this journal where they said that the physician is now the responsible guardian of the lunatic and must ever remain so, unless by some calamitous reverse, the progress of the world and civilization should be arrested and turned back in the direction of practical barbarism, okay? And so, so that they, they wanted people who were mentally ill to be looked after by doctors. And this kind of narrative was then reflected in Parliament who introduced the Medical Act in 1858, where they legally recognized medical doctors as carers of, mad, of, the, of the mad. So despite the many cases of abuse in asylums, rather than dismantle them, it, they just led to more and more reforms. And so between the 1800s and the 1900s, the asylum population rose from 5,000 to 100,000 people who were living in these places. And that was kind of a result of both an increase in admissions, but a decrease in discharges. And the causes of madness, as they called it at the time, there was a sociogenic narrative here at this point, particularly by people like Karl Marx. He viewed uh, mental health as being the result of economic conditions and as the fault of capitalism. Um, so there was other thinking around, but the main narrative was this somatogenic understanding of what mental illness is and what it's caused by. 
And this idea that there is a physical illness, a virus or a difference in your brain structure or a neurotransmitter issue that's driving your um, kind of distress. Um, and it was around this time that Morel proposed that degeneration was cumulative over generations. If you had two people with a mental illness and they had a child, that child would be even more mentally ill and so on and so forth. And that led to the degenerationist theory, which was a precursor to the later eugenics theory, um, which we don't have time to go into, but um, yeah, it was not pleasant. Um, and this kind of takes us now to the 1900s, right? So we've got this profession, we've got all these people working in this profession, but they still had a huge, huge issue in that diagnosis was largely idiosyncratic. So that means that depending on the professional and what they thought, you'd get a different diagnosis. There was no kind of systematic way to diagnose people with different conditions. And that was a big issue in terms of legitimacy. And what, what, what alienists and, in, and at this time became psychiatrists wanted was a classification system like they had for physical illness, because they thought then that that would put them on a par with kind of physical health doctors and they would gain some legitimacy. So in Germany, most of this work was kind of done and real coined the term psychiatry, which comes from the Greek word meaning soul and doctor. But it was Emil Kraepelin who had this massive, massive breakthrough and it has shaped how we think about mental illness today. So he argued that mental illness falls into a small number of discoverable types, and these can be identified by direct observation of brain diseases or by discovering the cause of the illness, so the illness's etiology. And he wrote the textbook of psychiatry, which contained a list of different psychiatric diseases that you could classify and what the symptoms of those diseases were. And this was huge because before then there was no standardized way of assessing people, right? So this was the first step in this, in this kind of uh, movement. So uh, Kraepelin using the asylum populations he had access to collected over a thousand case studies to collect to test his classificatory schemes. And so this textbook of psychiatry was born. And we still use this approach today, right? So the ICD-10 uh, is, is, a, is a manual written by the World Health Organization that helps classify physical and mental health disorders. And um, the DSM was developed in kind of response to that. And the DSM is what we use today, which classif classifies just mental health disorders and is used um, in the UK and in the US especially, I can't speak to um, other countries, um, to help us classify and diagnose people with different mental health illnesses. So yeah, at this point then, where we're coming into, into today, mental illness typically in clinical settings is used as more of an umbrella term for several specific psychological disorders, okay? So we've moved away, people aren't just mad or mentally ill, they would come away with a particular label. So in the DSM, they attempt then to define a psychological disorder, okay? A specific disorder and what that actually is. And as you can see, given the length of the definition, so if you were to write a definition in one of your undergrad essays and it was a paragraph long, we would tell you off, right? This is a huge, huge definition. But they, they um, define mental disorder as a syndrome characterized by clinically significant disturbance in an individual's cognition, so their thinking, emotion regulation or behavior that reflects a dysfunction in the psychological, biological or developmental processes underlying mental functioning. Mental disorders are usually associated with significant distress or disability in social, occupational or other important activities. An expectable or culturally approved response to a common stressor or loss, such as the death of a loved one, is not a mental disorder. Socially deviant behavior and conflicts that are primarily between the individual and society are not mental disorders, unless the deviance or conflict results from a dysfunction in the individual as described above. Okay, meaty, right? Not something you can just reel off in the moment. Um, but there are some, there are some issues in, in terms of kind of how, how we start to define things. So kind of, oof, now, I say sort of like 30 years ago, but I forget that actually I'm much older than I was. And so maybe it's more like 50 years ago now. Um, clinical psychology used to be labeled abnormal psychology, right? Or abnormal psychiatry. And that was the, that was the names of the textbooks where you would find stuff on mental health. Um, and you can see in that definition that the DSM used, they start to talk about culturally acceptable behavior, 
right? So now we're starting to stray into things like social norms. So social norms are commonly expected standards of behaving in society according to the majority, right? So if you're not in the majority, you're considered to be deviant in your behavior. And some of these some of these rules are very, are very explicit. So it's not okay to murder somebody. We have laws against that. But some of these rules are really implicit. So it's not really okay to go up to a stranger and ask them to rub your back. But it's unlikely that your mum and dad ever actively told you that. You just know, right, that that's not okay. Um, and what they do is allow um, for regulation of normal social behaviour. And so deviations from these are seen to be breaking the rules of society. And um, so the definition that we're using does start to kind of tap into some of this stuff. And this becomes a problem because who gets to define what's normal and what is abnormal, right? And what about those people who don't identify with the majority? And how do we handle those? Another issue when we start to think about this idea of kind of culturally normal, culturally usual behavior is again, how we define this abnormal, right? So distress is one of the most common features needed for a diagnosis, okay? Um, it comes up in almost all of the diagnostic criteria for every disorder you could have. But what is the issue causing the distress? How much distress is too much distress? Where's the cutoff? Who decides what the cutoff is? What about valid distress? So you'd expect someone to be upset at the death of a parent, for example. And you can start to see this, but what about the death of a pet? So there are some kind of narratives that you hear like online and stuff where people want time off work to mourn the loss of their beloved pet and their workplaces are like, no dude, that doesn't count, right? Who's saying what distress is valid and normal? Also, if we think about danger and dysfunction, so, oh, if the behaviour, if what the person is doing is dangerous, if it's dysfunctional, then that's a mental illness. But what about binge drinking at uni? That's pretty dangerous and could, you could probably argue dysfunctional, but is that a mental health issue? And who's, the, who's it a problem for? Who is it dangerous for and for whom? And yeah, why is it a problem, right, for society? You also then have this issue of duration. And this is actually a really important one because for example, in the DSM, you could be labeled with a mental illness called prolonged grief disorder. If you have been grieving over a relative for, I think it's three years, I think is the cutoff and then you end up with a mental illness. But who gets to decide how long is too long, right? Where does, like, how do we figure that stuff out? Another method that we use quite commonly at the moment um, and something that you will notice if anyone's ever accessed uh, kind of mental health services before is this statistically uncommon, right? So I'm hoping that you can't see this bottom thing. Maybe I'll hide it, I think that's better. Um, so human characteristics and traits tend to fall on what we call a normal distribution graph, okay? In which the majority of people tend to be sort of even about height, tend to be average height in here. And then you get some people who are super tall and some people who are really short, okay? But the majority of the people tend to be of a kind of sort of an average height. And we use this uh, in mental health as well. So if you think about things like low mood, um, if you were going to rate it on a scale, most people will be kind of here. Some people will be really sad. Some people will be really, really happy. And so when we ask um, you to fill out questionnaires like the PHQ-9, um, what we're doing is using this method, right? So you will get the PHQ-9. It's a list of questions you've got to rate yourself on. And if you score a certain score, you end up in this extremely high, high bracket, and then you get your label of depression or anxiety or whatever it is that we're measuring, okay? So this is a model that we often use today to help differentiate and diagnose. So is this the only way of thinking about stuff or no? So some people do argue that actually experiencing distress is normal and it's a part of the human experience. So Hay said to be human is to feel pain in ways that are orders of magnitude more pervasive than what other creatures on the planet Earth feel. Um, and there's research that suggests that throughout your life, you've got about a 50-50 chance of struggling with suicidal thoughts at a moderate to severe level for at least two weeks. So what are we doing here? Are we accidentally labeling normal human experience as abnormal? Should we even have these, this separation? 
kind of in terms of sort of theoretical thinking and in academic literature, this is something that people um, argue about to, to this day. So taking the focus back to this magical DSM diagnostic statistical manual of, of mental illnesses, right? Where does it come from and how does it work? So um, it was revised in 2013. It has actually been recently revised. I'm not sure if it's actually been released yet. It was due to be released, I think in April, I haven't seen it. But essentially what happens when, you, when they revise this book is that you get sort of 400 experts from 13 different countries representing different disciplines. And they all come together to hold um, these different international research conferences. There are 13 in total held between 2003 and 2008. And in these international research conferences, they talk about the latest research evidence, they identify gaps in our knowledge and understanding, um, and you know, sort of recommendations and suggestions for potential diagnostic criteria. The DSM task force and work groups are then selected and chosen, and they start to build and develop proposals for changes to the DSM based on these research conferences, okay? And then they go through a series of steps. So once you have your DSM task force members, they split up into specialist diagnostic panels. So you will have a group of people that work just on mood disorders, a group that work just on anxiety, a group that work on neurodevelopmental disorders, and they all take and they are all specialists in those fields. Okay. They have a look at the proposals for the DSM five changes to be made. They develop and kind of add their own ideas to that. They then. Uh, go out and test these changes in the field. So they get clinicians to kind of practice, um, move that, um, practice using these new diagnostic criteria and get feedback on how that went. We then enter in a review period where public and professionals can review and comment on these proposed changes. But ultimately the working groups collaborate with their advisors and reviewers and have the final say on this diagnostic criteria and changes that come into place. Now, who decides? So this was, I can't remember if this, I think this was the, these are the task force people who were on the DSM-5 task force. And as you can see, they are predominantly made up of white men of a certain age who will come from professional backgrounds, okay? And that's not to say that people who have professional experience and expertise in these things should be excluded from the conversation. But what I want you to start to think about is what, how differently we might think about mental illness if this panel looked different and had different backgrounds. Um, and from the ones presented here. And what I also wanted to do by showing you their picture was to remind you that they're human and that that means that they are subject to thinking biases, group decision-making problems. They are subject to the same prejudices and discriminatory beliefs as the culture and society in which they live, right? These aren't machines that are doing this. These are human beings trying to work, work in this system. And so they are influenced by their social and political contexts. So for the DSM-5, 69% of the task force had ties, had financial ties to the pharmaceutical industry, which meant that they were making money off of drugs. The, pan, the panel, so the specialist groups that had the highest levels of ties to drug companies, happened to be panels where drugs were the first line of intervention. So the mood disorders group, 100% of the clinicians there had ties to Big Pharma, okay? Now, it's important for us to be aware of that, and not because I think or I'm accusing anyone on those panels of actively trying to invent illnesses or trying to stack the cards in their favor so they can make more money. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is that these kinds of relationships, these kinds of belief formats will bias their thinking, probably unconsciously, right? And this became a really, really, really big problem with the DSM-5 for, for this reason. So within the DSM-5, the group, the, the proposals for changes attempted to add specific disorders or change diagnostic criteria for disorders, which would have meant that more people would have been eligible to take medicine, okay? So they wanted to introduce attenuated psychotic risk syndrome, which would have increased the numbers of people who could be diagnosed with psychosis. They added premenstrual dysphoric disorder into mood disorders. And for major depressive disorder, so what we would call depression, 
there was normally an exclusion criteria that you couldn't get labeled with depression if you'd had a recent bereavement. They removed that exclusion, okay? Why is that a problem? We haven't got time to go through all of them and talk about all of them in depth, but just kind of briefly for premenstrual dysphoric disorder, people found it problematic because there's no evidence, consistent evidence to support its existence, okay? This, the few studies that claim the etiology is hormonal have serious methodological flaws, okay? There's no standardized way of making this diagnosis. It's very kind of on the whim of the person that you're talking to. And yet, despite this lack of evidence, people still keep talking about this idea that there's a hormonal or neurotransmitter transmitter model for this disorder. Um, and therefore, people should be taking SSRIs, which are antidepressants. So some of the evidence being used, or some, in some cases where there is a lack of good evidence, that doesn't seem to be influencing the decision making on, on some of these panels, right? And, and people took issue, so feminist psychologists took issue because they felt that this disorder sustained the stereotype of women as having labile emotions and being um, the kind of victim of their own hormones, right? And it undermined then the role of violence against women, the role of stress in women's distress. And it's not the first time that we've had these controversial disorders. Homosexuality is probably a really famous one that you'd have heard of. That was in the DSM as a mental health disorder until uncomfortably recently, right? And it just kind of reminds us that the people who are making these decisions are subject to the same prejudices, the same um, kind of problematic views as the cultures that they live in, okay? And so we need to be thinking about that when we think about this, this diagnostic criteria and how it's created. We also need to think about the role of publication bias. So the research that we have access to is published in journals and journals only really accept and publish research sent to them where the research has found something significant, okay? Because if you have a non-significant finding, so you've looked at whether CBT helps people with depression and you found that it doesn't work, that may have been due to a methodological flaw because the research was poor, people aren't interested in reading that. And so within the research literature, we have this overwhelming positive bias in what we read, okay? And this is really clearly outlined in um, the literature on antidepressants. So if you look at just the literature, the published literature, you see that antidepressants are 94% effective. If you look at both published and unpublished literature, which is what the FDA do, and they approve medicines in America, the effectiveness of antidepressants is actually 54%, okay? And so the research evidence even that the DSM teams are using, they use published research, may have bias in it and may be kind of um, a problematic, problematic in itself. Other people have also taken issue with our current diagnostic kind of model and the DSM manual. <clears throat> and this is because one of, the, one of the functions of the DSM was that it was supposed to be able to create this like shared language between professionals, right? And between professional practice and research. So if I research depression, the research that I make would be valid for clinicians who work with depression in clinical settings because we're using this same language. But the BPS um, kind of came out in 2012 and said, well, since two people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia or personality disorder may possess no two symptoms in common, it's difficult to see what communicative benefit is being served by these diagnoses, okay? So you can have people with the same diagnosis and have nothing in common. The DSM also, um, with the DSM-5, there is also now 636,120 different ways that you can receive a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, what on earth is that, right? Imagine if I said to you, here's a table, but there are 636,120 ways to define what this table is, yeah? That wouldn't be okay. And so there's issues around validity. Are, is what we're talking about a, a construct, a thing in itself, or is it not, okay? And there are some issues around that. So psychiatry, who um, are largely kind of the main profession, I would say, that were involved in developing the DSM, 
they psychiatry kind of collectively a lot of them do admit that diagnosis is an imperfect system but it's the only one we've got does anybody come up with any reasonable alternatives mm, not really um and there's also this issue of comorbidity so you can get three or four different diagnostic labels and is it because you have three or four different mental illnesses or is it because we need to change the way we group our symptoms right maybe you just have one mental illness if we group it in this different way um, they also argue that, yeah, diagnostic categories change over time, but that's normal. Yeah, that's, what, that's, how, that's how the medical field um, uh, evidence kind of changes as well as we, as we learn more. And they, they emphasise that actually it is important to think beyond just the diagnosis and to develop a formulation, which I'll talk to in just, talk to in just a second. Um, and they also argued, um, so this, these uh, Craddock and Minor Wallace are two psychiatrists in particular that have this kind of very pragmatic relationship with diagnosis that it's useful for patients to understand their experiences. So what do our service users actually think, right? Because we have all these big academic talks and we think about all these theories, but actually for me, what the most important thing is, is are these helpful for people in distress, okay? Is what we're doing helping people who are distressed, who need help? So the answer to that question is mixed. Some service users like it, like diagnosis, and there are current kind of understandings of mental illness. They find it's a really helpful way to name the problem. It helps them to feel their distress is legitimate and that they weren't to blame. It helps them to connect with other people with similar experiences, access support services. And so for some people, having a label or, or this current framework of mental illness is really, really positive for them. For others, they feel that kind of our current diagnostic system is negative and that certain labels such as sort of personality disorder or psychosis can lead to social exclusion and stigma. Some also felt that it kind of gave them this prognosis of doom. So if you were told, oh, you have this illness and this illness is caused because your brain is structured in a particular way, how do you get back from that? What, what do you do to relieve that distress? Yeah. So some people kind of um, find it difficult for those reasons. And for some, they shared that it changed the way they saw themselves and they found themselves developing like an illness identity, um, which they didn't really feel very comfortable with. But again, opinions are split. So for other people, uh, so this was a quote from um, a paper written by Johnston. When I was told I was depressed, it gave me a framework of understanding and a first grip on what was happening to me, okay? And then you see, however, this quote from the Castillo, Castillo paper um, with, from somebody who was diagnosed with personality disorder, where they say, you feel like second or more like third class citizens. You only have to look at the definitions given in the DSM and read comments such as limited capacity to express feelings, disregard for social obligation, callous on concern for others. The list is endless, but the things these comments have in common is that they're not helpful in any way. So for some people, the language around these diagnostic labels is really, really difficult and uncomfortable. So are there alternatives? What are the alternatives? Well, clinical psychology came up with this idea of formulation, which some of you may have come across. So a formulation can be defined as a hypothesis about a person's difficulties, which draws from psychological theory. So the aim of the formulation is to summarize service users' core problems, show the service users show how the service users' difficulties may relate to one another using a theory. So kind of making links between the way you think and how that might have an impact on how you feel and how that then may change how you behave and how all of those things link together, right? It's very CBT kind of theory there. Um, they may also suggest on the basis of psychological theory why, the, why these problems have developed. So thinking about things like attachment theory um, or kind of trauma theories. But we also, the aim of the formulation is to give rise up to a plan of intervention, right? So what we can do about it to help that person feel less distressed. And formulations are always open to revision and they change over time. So here is a table that compares the two. Full disclosure, Johnston is a clinical psychologist. So this table is heavily biased in favor of formulation um, compared to diagnosis. So formulation can include social context. It can include relationships. It can be culturally sensitive. It's supposed to be collaborative, so you develop it with the person you're working with. Um, the idea is that it is less stigmatizing. There's no medical consequences. You don't get, um, you know, you don't get a formulation, and then that formulation leads to a medical treatment. So there's fewer social consequences, and it can promote agency, right? If 
it can it can help people see actually if I do something different I might feel better I don't, I don't have to just accept that this is how I feel and we can also make sure that we include personal meaning now formulation is by no means perfect and is by no means is a golden solution to the problems that we have if you want to hear more about formulation you're going to have to come to Kent uh, and we can we can talk to you a little bit more about it and about all these topics in general but we started the lecture with this idea of what is mental illness and essentially it depends on who you ask so is it an umbrella term for a group of specific disorders is it a biologically driven illness caused by neurotransmitters or changes in the brain is it uh, not an illness at all, but kind of distress caused by social, social environments like war and COVID and um, difficulty in relationships? Is it just a part of our normal experience and we need to stop seeing it as, as a difference? So there, there is no single answer. There's no kind of consensus in the literature about what this is. Um, and if you come to Kent, these are the ideas that we kind of talk about and pursue kind of in more detail to kind of help you make up your own minds. Yeah, there's no right or wrong, wrong question here. So that's the end of the talk um, that I had planned. So I hope, oops, I'm just gonna try and stop this. So I hope you guys found that interesting, vaguely, um, helpful, like enjoyable. Um, and I know now we move to 